Her priest is praying that she passes in her sleep. We all are. And it seems like a strange prayer. It seems almost like the wrong thing to pray for, doesn't it? To pray for someone's death. Not because you hate them, but because you love them. But we're praying that she passes gently and quickly because she's 99. She's tired. She's trapped in her body and she's not really able to connect with the world around her. Um, she can't hear very well even with her hearing aids in. And the macular eye degeneration has made it hard to recognize faces. So she's not even sure who's around her at times. She's down to about 83 pounds and she'll tell you she wants to go. She wants to go home and be with Jesus. So we pray. We pray that she passes gently and quickly. It's, it's a hard prayer, but it's a loving one. We, we don't want to say goodbye. We don't want to let go, but we still pray for it because we love her. We pray for grace and mercy in this situation. We pray for God's kingdom, and we ultimately pray that God's will will be done in this situation. And as I reflect on her coming death, and today we are in a passage in which Jesus is preparing for his own death and resurrection, I am encouraged by Jesus' prayer here that we get a chance to journey into the very heart of Jesus and the will of God as he prays for himself, his disciples, and us. So welcome to Church in the Mall Online. I hope that you'll let us know that you're with us with a hello in the comments. And if you're new, please, please take some time and fill out our digital connect card. We'd love to get to know you better. You'll find it at churchinthemall.com slash welcome. And you'll also find more information about Easter. I want to share some of our plans with you today. Um, Easter, April 4th, is coming, and we are excited to celebrate with you. We have two opportunities for in-person worship. One at 8.45 a.m., and that service will be outdoors in our parking lot. Um, so you'll want to dress for the weather and perhaps bring a camp chair or two. Um, we'll have some folding chairs available as well. And our second service at 10.45 is indoors um, with masks and social distancing, of course. And there'll also be an online option at 10.45 a.m. as well. So there's three chances for you to worship with us on Easter, 8.45 a.m. in the parking lot. 10.45 a.m. inside, and 10.45 online as well. There's more information um, at churchinthemall.com slash welcome, as well as a sign-up form if you're interested in helping us with any of those services on Easter. Um, there's also some more information, some announcements, so I encourage you to check that out at churchinthemall.com slash welcome. There's also a, an opportunity for you to give securely online there, um, or find out more information about how you could mail in your gift. Um, and as we, we turn our attention back to our worship today um, with John's Gospel, um, I encourage you to take some time this week to read this chapter in its entirety. Um, it's, it's not very long, um, but it is a powerful, powerful passage. And we're going to kind of unpack it today. But um, there's something about coming back to God's Word again and again that new insights become revealed. And this is, this is a wonderful prayer. And in prayer, I believe that we reveal our hearts. And this prayer today, Jesus begins by praying for himself. And it's, it's actually the shortest section, which I find a little convicting because often I pray most for myself. And we see Jesus doing the opposite here. And as he begins to, to pray, um, we see that in essence, this prayer is drawing together everything that the gospel story has been about up to this point. That in this prayer, we come to the heart of that intimate relationship that Jesus has with God the Father. And as Jesus begins, he is really celebrating. He is celebrating the fact that his work is done. That all that God the Father has given them, that has been laid before the disciples. So he's, he's kind of accomplished his mission. And that's why he's 
celebrating at the very beginning of this prayer. And as he is doing this, he's also making a request. He is asking that he be exalted, that he be glorified, that he be lifted up, celebrated to a position alongside God the Father. And this is really interesting because we don't really think of Jesus as being egotistical. And this kind of sounds a little bit like, oh, you want to be lifted up, you want to be celebrated. But in fact, he's asking for this for our benefit. Because in Jewish tradition, when the king, the Messiah, the chosen one, took his place alongside God the Father, when he would be exalted over the world, then the age to come would truly begin. And this age to come is really what the Jewish prophets were longing for, the Lord's day, the new life that was to come. And that this new life wasn't just about um, quantity, you know, really long forever and ever, but also more importantly about quality. This is quality of life. This is life with God the Father, the very presence of God in God's kingdom. And that this new life would come to birth in this world through Jesus. That once he had completed his final victory over death itself, all of his followers, all who trusted in Jesus and believed that he had truly come from God the Father and had revealed God's character and purpose, all of them can and will possess eternal life right here and now. So in essence, when Jesus is praying for himself, he's still praying for us. He's praying for our benefit. And then he moves into praying for his disciples that he knows he is going away and he wants to make sure that they are cared for and protected and that he entrusts them to God. And he's interestingly enough giving some instructions, not because he doesn't trust God, but because he does. He trusts God with the very welfare of his disciples. And as he prays this, knowing that he's going away, trusting the welfare of the disciples to God the Father, he is trusting in that relationship that he has with God. He's trusting this Father that he has known and loved throughout his own earthly life. This Father he knows will care for them every bit as much as he has done himself. The world, that world that is in rebellion against God. This world hates Jesus and will hate them because of him. And they will be threatened and they will be abused. They, they don't belong to that world. And so that world will come on the attack because they're going to be sent into it. They're going to be sent into it to spread this message of love and hope that Jesus has for the whole world. And Jesus knows that they, his disciples, will need protecting. That's really what this prayer is about. And that as the ones that God has given to Jesus and that he is now entrusting back to God the Father, that there's this sense of belonging to God's kingdom and that they are be handed back to God for his safekeeping. That they are distinct from the world, even though they are in it. Um, that they are a new people because of this relationship with Jesus. So they're no longer from the world. They're a new people because of that belonging, that sense of identity now as part of God's kingdom. And that they now have to kind of live in two worlds. They live in the world of of identifying with Jesus as they go out into the world that is opposed to Jesus. And that they're going to need God's protection because there's a danger of being pulled back into that world, being pulled back into selfishness, into rebellion against God. That Jesus wants to ensure that all that he's taught him will remain. That during his public ministry, he taught and he led them. He looked after them, much like a shepherd looks after his sheep. And because he's lead, leaving now, going back to the Father, he's entrusting his disciples to the Father, who will continue that work of keeping them safe. 
and that in praying for them now, he's simply praying that that world, that what he's begun, the Father will complete. This is such a serious and beautiful prayer. And it's probably one of the most serious things Jesus ever says. And that's why deep down it's some of the most joyful and hopeful. And as Jesus kind of wraps up praying for his, his disciples, the ones he knew in his earthly ministry, he begins to pray then for those who will believe in me through their word. That is the word of his followers. That Jesus begins to pray for those who will come to know God through his disciples. Jesus is talking about you. Jesus is talking about me. You see, after his death and resurrection, Jesus' followers would announce this message of hope and resurrection to the whole world. And those who heard it passed it on and on and on and on. The church really, the church is really no more than one generation away from extinction. All it takes is for one single generation not to hand it off. And this is what Jesus is praying for as he prays for us, his disciples to come. That he thinks about you and me and all the followers in this and every generation. He's praying that we may be one. That we are to be people united around this mission and this purpose that we would kind of in the old words say one holy and universal people that we would be united in this church this gathering this following of jesus that we find our grounding in the teachings of the apostles um, in particular that we would be united that in unity it wouldn't simply be an outward thing that it would be an inward thing that would flow out of us that our unity would be based on reflecting nothing less than the unity between the father and the son i hope that you picked up on this because i feel like i'm repeating myself over and over because that's exactly what john's gospel is doing here it continually goes back to that unity in Jesus and God the Father. It goes back to that beautiful, intimate relationship between Jesus and God. And that unity is what is to connect us and that we would be unified. This is what Jesus prays for us as he's looking at death on the cross, that this is, is his priority for us is unity, that we are to live in that. And I believe it goes back to even what we see in chapter 13 of John's gospel. This is how people will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, if you have love for one another, that is unity, my friends. And that is vital. That is vital for our well-being. That is vital for our relationship with God. And it is vital for our relationship with each other, but it is vital for the world to see that in us. That when we tear and bite and, and go after one another, when we don't act in love towards one another, we defeat the words that we speak about Jesus. We undermine them. So unity is critical. And that unity is based in love and founded on that love that Jesus and God have for one another. And that Jesus will return even in this passage to an earlier theme that his followers are to be with him to see his glory. That they are to know and experience the fact that the Father has exalted him as the king of the world, the Messiah. And that is in love. They are to know that the love which God, the creator, has given to him has also made him the loving Lord of all. That when Jesus is exalted, the reason is nothing other than love. 
that when Jesus is exalted, the reason is nothing other than love. Not to prove a point, not to prove that you're right, but that we do it in love. Not for ego, for love. See, this is not the sort of kingdom that enables others to think of themselves as better than someone else. This is not about um, being on the winning team. This is the sort of kingdom, the sort of sovereignty that commits them as it committed Jesus, as it commits us to loving service. See, that's really what this whole prayer is coming down to. It's about the love of the Father surrounding Jesus and that this same love as a bond and a badge surrounds all of Jesus's people, making him present to them and through them to the world. It is this Jesus, this man who prayed for you and me. It is this Jesus, this man who prayed for you and for me. This high priest who set himself apart for the Father's service and did it gladly. It's this man, this Jesus, who we will now watch as he goes forward to complete, to complete the work of love. See, that's ultimately what leads Jesus to the cross, is his great love for us and for the Father. And so this week, I encourage you to make this prayer your own. That when, when we enter into this chapter and see what happens, that we are being invited into the very heart of that intimate relationship between God the Father and Jesus. And that we get to be part of it. That we get to have it and belong to it. And then we get to see it happen all around us. So what this prayer embodies and what its central matter is, is in love. So this week, I want you to pray it. I want us to pray it. So when you read it, when it says I, put Jesus in and then replace they and them with I and me. So when it says I, use Jesus. When it says they and them, use I and me. Pray it. Pray it with awe. Pray it in the knowledge that this was prayed out of great love. And then pray it with the light. So that you might experience that loving relationship between Jesus and God. Amen.